think. start tipping the trailer up so it makes it easier for us to slide it out at the other end on a shallow angle out. Now the first ship we're going to pull out is the Oriana. That's the first one to go back inside on the shelf unit. We'll slide it across to the table over there. Pick it up and break it down straight. And we'll look for a moment, come up here, grab underneath on your side, lift gently and slide along. Down. That's it. It's mainly to do because of those things sticking out, it's going to be awkward trying to manoeuvre around. So doing it the side end, so we've got these bars mm -hmm. in the way, we'll have to edge it out backwards towards me. On the count of three, two, one, lift and move. Then put your model down or put the bow down. All right. I'm going to get yourself over Okay. All right. Okay. And then we just put it down on this troll. sliding into there. Okay, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Cool. Okay, on the count of three, two, one, up, across, gently down, bring it out towards you a bit more, the bow, bring the bow out, not forward. That's it. Check, it's sitting on the brackets properly. Take a few days for this to settle. You'll hear creaking and groaning and cracking. Oh. And, yep, that's cool. Approved. Bin, 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 bin. And finally. Now, Tony, this cord that I'm going to dangle underneath, I'll swing around. Now, I want you to feed that cord inside the ship. Which bit? There, there. Yep, that one. Yep, thank you. Just feed it in easily. Gently. Thank you. Now look. And there you go. And then, so I'll touch this if I'm okay health wise. Next spring, I'm going to sand down the Oriana's draft, which is the burgundy section underneath the hull, because there's been a lot of cracks and leakages over the years, and I've been using wrong fillers and everything else, and it's got to be sanded down, and then re it with a special marine lacquer, and new um, burgundy paint means I've got to take this green boot off, then sand down the, well sand the paint off, so you're back to the raw wood, reseal everything up pr properly uh, with fillers then use the um, marine lacquer to properly seal the wood up then I should get at least another 20 years use out of that then I'll also then uh, finish off building the lifeboats which uh, they were never built so that's why uh, there's gaps in between and then um, Replace the propeller shafts because they're much too small uh, down the back end here at the stern. Uh, particularly the shaft itself, it's only 4mm and it's more prudent to use 5mm shafts where they have the strength for their high spin. Um, which I'll have to replace all of that. 
and then rewire the model where I can inside it uh, to make it a lot more efficient uh, in usage so we can get the model working once more. It does light up, there's about 150 light globes in, in there that lights up. All right, next ship. along with the back end of this cradle out a bit further so we can get the bow a bit more out of the trailer that makes it easier for me to undo the frames yeah. flip the frames over to the side Just that far. Always leans over to the right. And over. And down. Pause for a second. Just got to align it on the. Just a bit more to your left. That's it. All right. You all right? Yep. Three, two, one, up. That's all right. Now come down towards me. And down, if you want to put it down. No, it's just I've got to get it getting itself over there. That's why I was suggesting put it down if you want to get it. One, up, go. Forward a bit more. That's it, down. Should do it. Brilliant. Um, because it's the beast. It eats up all my money, all the materials. Budgeted for $10,000 is now $10,364 I've spent on the model, but I think that's about as far as I will be going. Yeah, that. That, right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got it right. And this is a real piece of a vessel to um, manoeuvre. And this one we've got to take extra care because when a very good friend of mine designed this trailer, we only gave a ma margin of two millimetres from the top of the mast to the bottom of this frame. Yeah, and it happens to be at the wrong angle right down towards the front. Mm -hmm. And if we tip the model that way or that way, the mast catches and snap. So, and the funnel's not that far behind. Three, two, one, go. And that's enough. That's step one. Probably go back a bit further because if we put that on too soon up here, yeah. bang, the mast is right up underneath it, and you've got to. It's not easy to judge 
where do you do it? So it's a bit of guessing. All up the the model at the moment weighs now 60, 65 kilos, and that's just the motors, propulsion units, the lighting, wiring, and the overall weight of all the materials to build the model in the first place. Then um, the cradle is probably about 100 kilos in itself, because it's got to bear all that weight and it's got to be fairly firm. It's Rigid. One, two, three, go. I have to be honest with you. I've done a pretty good job on this model. The port side is about 75% complete. Okay, we... Oh, there, the side right. to pop off. Oh, okay. Well, why is it not going on, that's why. Um, as you'll see, these are still swinging because I haven't actually put the lifelines on all the finite detail. Then tie it with those, which is what you do on the real ship, you tie it around and around the back. And that holds the boats in. So when the ship is rock and roll, which is not often with the Queen Mary, um, the lifeboats will always remain rigid and abutted to the davits, which is that's been going on for the last 120 years with all liners, uh, even with um, naval warships. But I've got to finish off these um, catamaran lifeboats, catamaran because it's double hulled, and this is all moulded. I've made a moulding for it, then a casting out of it, and then I've used a resin, lightweight resin. Uh, to make all uh, 24 uh, lifeboats. These are classified as lifeboats, but they're also called tenders, and they're the ones they use when the ship has to anchor out in harbour, and it's called ship to shore transfer, or vice versa, which is what I did down in Tasmania at Port Arthur about two and a half years ago. So I've just got to finish that off, but also the the smoke glass balustrades. So I've done decks 9, 10, 11. I'll do deck 12 and I've still got to do all of deck 8 at the bottom there. But then I've got to go around the other side and start matching up what I've already done on this side uh, so we keep in unison. And then I've already installed the inflatable rafts here with their cranes and the, uh, the, what they call the stabiliser. So if the ship does roll over and these float off, they actually hit these and actually rolls them right away from the sinking ship. That's the whole idea. It was a stipulation by the Americans and that's why it's set up that way. I, got my, I actually um, asked the captain, sorry, um, two years ago, why was it there? Because I thought it was a bit odd, but he explained to me that's what it's all about. It's just a, an extra precautionary safety procedure under the SOLAS standards, S-O-L-A-S, -S, Safety of Life at Sea. That's an international regulation under the International uh, Maritime Organization, I-M-O, and that's the official Queen Mary's number under the I-M-O for radio calls, etc. Um, these roofs will slide back, like the tennis court roof in Melbourne uh, at Brodlave Arena. They just slide back automatically. So this is open, particularly on her cruises in the um, tropical waters. Um, and then the rest of the time, it's just simply closed. But you're getting the sun filtering through, so it warms up very nicely in there. Um, and you've just got the open daylight so, uh, scenario during the daytime. Two, one, up, down. Magic. On the counter, three, two, one, up, down. Yeah, I'll go the whole way. Okay, be prepared. Three, two, one, up, go backwards.
um, because most of the wages down the arse end, um, and therefore we just leave it on this trolley now. It just stays on the tro trolley permanently. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that um, big there raised a couple hundred kilos, aren't they? Oh yeah, easy. One. And uh, that's what I use to swing the model around inside the, the room there. Because it was dumped on a nature strip outside the Glen Huntley Depot about, oh, whatever, many years ago. And one of the people said, oh, look at this. And I said, oh. So I grabbed it. It was rusting. So I de-rusted it. Put Andy Rust on it. Put the carpet on the top. And then I've used it as a model tro uh, trolley ever since. I must have banged it on something. Oh, in your funnel. Ooh. Yeah. Because once you do the paint surface on it, it's got to be all the same. Mm. Which I've used black gloss paint, then use clear matte paint mm. to match it down. But when you start putting more matte paint onto it or gloss, it wrecks the whole surface. You've got to actually paint all of it again. Mm. Now I've got to fill that in. It's a Bam! And that's quite a that's, a, that's actually a, a neat hole. Yeah. It's hit something neat. Very square. So, um, the actual painting side of it is very difficult. You've got to be very careful. And that's what I did with the black freeboard, as it's called. Uh, it's all gloss, black gloss paint. Uh, and there was uh, five coats of that. Then four coats of the clear matte lacquer. So the gloss black helps to seal and then the clear lacquer on top to matte it down. Um, but there is also 15 coats of lacquer on the wood underneath all that black paint. So you're probably talking what, twin, d d d d d d nearly 20 coats of paint on it. Sand each coat, the old-fashioned way. Um, to make sure it's absolutely waterproofed and well sealed and it's a nice smooth finish and same goes with the um, burgundy coloured draft um, the underwater section I think there I must have put on about 20 coats of lacquer inside and out uh, inside the hull and outside the hull uh, and then I used Norglass um, burgundy paint and there again, I probably put on about 10 coats of that. So it is totally waterproof. Um, and it extends the longevity of the, uh, the marine ply that we used underneath. And also between where the joins of the wood meet, I used um, auto fiberglass filler, which actually helps to bind the woods together. So if um, it expands and contracts at the same rate as the wood through the summer and winter months, warm water, very cold water. So no cracking will develop. And then all this paint on top of that to make very sure, because here in Australia things do go awry. And you've got to be very careful with all these models, particularly of our extreme summers where we endure 47 degrees uh, during the summer months and probably down to minus four or five degrees in winter. Uh, being semi-desert up here in Bendigo uh, the water in the, the lakes here can be very cold or quite pleasant but the model's sitting out in the really hot sun not that you want to sail on a very hot day you, you've got to be mad for it uh, but a lot of the warm summer months can affect the model ships and you've really got to be very careful what you're dealing with so I really don't want to look at this model theoretically for another 40 years before you need to probably start looking at repainting or do anything. Well, I won't be around by then, that's for sure. So, <laughs> it's somebody else's problem. But be noted. Um, so, that's my pride and joy. It's my largest model I've ever built. It is to scale. It is exactly, pretty much, I would say, it is accurate to the real ship in every shape and form and um, I'd say it's another 12 months before I finally finish it and that's why I want to get on with it now um, 
but yet again another promise. I want to see if I can get it in the water sailing later this year because we've uh, installed all the equipment to make the propulsion units work um, and we want to start looking at seriously doing the first sea trials later this year. But I keep on saying that year in, year out for the last four or five years, and we're all twiddling our thumbs the year, right? Next, next century. Um, so this model is quite able to sail. There's an old DVD that I might hand on to John and see if he can transfer it across into the main YouTube of where we did a float test some years ago at a lake down in Melbourne, where it just floated. It didn't work. Uh, but we were doing the stability test to make sure, have we got this right? What else have I got to do? And she held herself well. It even started to drag the tugboat. It's that big. Um, but there is some other uh, DVDs where another vessel was towing us and coped remarkably well. What we saw with the float tests and the so-called non-propulsion sea trials with this particular ship, um, very hard to get going. A lot of energy is required, but once you got going, the hull form, particularly the draft, is so beautifully designed, it needs a very little energy to get her going, keep her going uh, at a good speed, and she just simply glided through the water. It was extraordinary. Which then comes back to the man who oversaw the design of this ship, Stephen Payne that he really did look into his hydrodynamics uh, with great depth to get the best ability that once you've got the vessel going, you're using far, far less fuel to achieve the higher speeds that this liner needs to get across the North Atlantic. Remember, this is the only passenger liner in existence in the world built for a, uh, um, a passenger service from point A to point B. It is not classed as a cruise ship. She is a passenger liner and the only one in existence. Hence the reason why the bows are so slender. If you refer to the cruise ship, uh, Viking cruise ship in Norway, a couple of weeks ago where it got into serious trouble with heavy waves, look at the bow. It's very stubby, it's a cruise ship. And look what it got itself into, into great trouble. Uh, the Mary is built that if it does get into trouble, there's several dozen redundancies that it will never get into that sort of predicament of uh, total electrical power failure. She will keep going. Because she's way out in the middle of the Atlantic, there's nowhere to run except just go to the next major port that she was designated for, which could be New York or Southampton. And you're in the middle of the Atlantic and you've got to keep going. You can't stop. And that's what this particular ship was designed and built very similar to the old passenger liners of the 50s and 60s with p and and Cunard, Orient Lines, all those classic British ships that were built for the long runs from Britain to Australia. They were all built for those long endurance blue water runs. They were the true passenger liners. Even so, they did use them for cruising later. I've got to push the stern right over into the back corner to get the bow around. Then move forward. It's called the Arcadia, 1954. Um, uh, built. Now, ironically, this is the one that my grandmother used to live on. Uh, the ship from 1956 to 66, which was unheard of in those times for anyone to really, you know, when she was in her 60s then, to actually live on the ship, which is now common practice nowadays. But she found she got better service, better medical facilities in that era on a ship than she would ever get at a retirement home in England where she came from. And in those days, it was still really very close after the end of the Second World War. Things were really depressed and not a great deal of money. So she decided to live on board this and sailed around the world, constantly. 
So she was in a retirement home on sea and the world went past her the whole time. Met new people. So what a way to look at life. Um, and it used to come into Melbourne every, well, the time of year when she was ready for it. Um, every two years the Arcadia will come in, fly, um, and uh, we'd go on board. So I went on it a, a, quite a few times. Never sailed on it, but I just went on board. And um, at the moment I'm restoring it. It was built by somebody else. Um, originally made out of plaster of Paris, which sort of blew me away a little, but I heard about this individual some time ago and not um, favourable. Uh, and there's been a few anomalies within the actual setup of the model to what the real ship, and there's some things I recognise from memory, and then the photographs and research I've done, yeah, they were wrong. So we're now having to redo an upgrade thing to get it as accurate as, as possible to the original Arcadia. Interesting history with the Arcadia. Um, it was built at John Brown Yard in Glasgow, Scotland. It was built at about the same time as the Royal Yacht Britannia. Uh, there's a lot of things that they were actually swapping ideas between the two ships. There was an unmentioned scenario that in view of the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh's royal visit out to the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand, in 1954, they had to use the Shaw Savile Line uh, Gothic uh, for the Australian part of the tour, but Australia and New Zealand. Um, and the Royal, Bo Ro <laughs> royal Yacht Britannia was still under construction, launched uh, about a month before the Arcadia. And then there was always that nagging question, because the Britannia will be part of the British Royal Navy, there may be a time that the Britannia is not available, what do we do for the senior members of the royal family? Do we use the Arcadia, which the senior members of the royal family in earlier times in Britain used other p liners to come out to India or to Australia? One example was Prince George and Princess Mary, who opened up Parliament at Canberra. Uh, and also, particularly more so, uh, opened up Federation in Melbourne at the Exhibition Buildings. If you look at the huge painting of the opening uh, ceremony of Federation, it was in the Exhibition Hall, and there you'll see uh, Prince George and Princess Mary. Later, they became King George V and Queen Mary. Um, so they were using ships, the p ships then. So it was a case of, do we have the Arcadia uh, built? There was also a sister ship built to the Arcadia called Iberian, which was built at Harland and Wolf Yards in Belfast. That's where the Titanic was built many years prior. Very similar. The only difference was the funnels, which gives it away on identifying what, who was the Arcadia, who was the Iberian. And this particular part of the funnel, uh, it was the same company subcontracted out to work out What's the best design to get rid of all the smut that comes out of the funnel and doesn't fall on the deck behind? And if you look at the funnel on the Royal Yacht Britannia, it's a lower profile, but the similarities are there. That's one example. Uh, the bridge setup is identical to the original uh, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth bridges, because they were both built, all three built all four built in the same shipyard, which is John Brown Yards. Uh, so the similarities follow through, all the way through. That theme is always the same. Um, and John Brown was still one of the top um, shipyard builders uh, in the world at that time, particularly after the war, when all the shipyards were slowly trying to get their act together and build up because they've lost so much shipping, money was tight, and John Brown was the only one that had the financials to do it. Uh, and P&O also were wanting to desperately replace all their ships uh, from the losses of the Second World War. And they already started building these passenger liners to uh, fit in with the requirements of the Australian government for the migrant trade out here to Australia, the 10 pound poms as they used to nickname it. 
so you had the Chuzan, the Himalaya, then you had a lot of the Orient Line ships like the Orsova, um, any of the ships that call or started with the letter O. And this is a prime example of one of the running mates of the Orient Line that worked with the p and Lines, both famous British shipping companies. But the Oriana was built in um, Barrow in Furness, in the northwest of England, in Cumbria. And the Oriana was the last one to be built for the Orient Line with its original Orient Line livery, before p and took over Orient Line. Now, another ship that I've um, been building for the last um, year or so, but there's been a lot of stop-start, is this particular ship. I never sailed onto it, and I think I brought it up in previous recordings. It's called the Willem Roos. It was a very uh, famous Dutch liner. There's a bit of a history, but if you go into Google and do your research, you'll find the actual long history of it. But it was unknown, more or less, as a Dutch liner. But later, when it was sold off in 64 and was completely refit, it became the famous Achille Lauro, which a lot of people would remember here in Australia and New Zealand. So it was the same hull, similar superstructure, different funnels to what the Willem Roos was originally. Um, but it was, that was Dutch, that was Italian, it was part of the Italia line. Now, it's the Wilma Roos that I know so well because my father used to go down there and settle the accounts with the captain, with the Shell Oil Company. My father was involved as the treasurer for the Shell Oil Company of Australia, and the head office was in Melbourne. The Geelong refinery was still new, big time. All the oil was bunkered up by a vessel, a bunker vessel, from Geelong to Station Pier, because the pipeline still hadn't been brought through to Altona at that stage, they were still putting it together. So he used to go down, and then when all the accounts were settled, my father would then use the big old, huge telex machines to get through to Shell head office, The Hague, because it belonged to Royal Dutch Shell, which is the royal family that owns it. And there was a royal warrant on what was called Rotterdam Lloyd that operated the Willem Roos. Um, and because of that, there was a bit of an agreement between the royal family to who was going to pay the bill, or Shell was going to pay the bill, uh, because the company was struggling to survive. Um, it originally was built and used from 1947 through to a, probably about 1957 uh, as the, um, what would you call it, the trade between uh, Rotterdam uh, and Java. This would be now called Indonesia. But after the um, Republic of Indonesia was developed in the late 40s, uh, by the mid-50s, the Dutch had to get out and therefore the ship never went back to the Netherlands. And then they had to find another trace, which the Willem Roos was one of the first liners to actually do around the world cruising plus migrant trade, um, but around the world version just before p and and Orient started it. So they actually took the ship offline, refurbed it inside and out uh, into a very nice looking ship uh, from 1959 through to 64. And it was a beautiful ship. And when it was in Melbourne, which is usually about four times a year, um, my mother and I would be taken down by my father and we would have dinner uh, with the captain at the captain's table. So it was all very, whoa big time, particularly in the 60s when the world was still very blinkered. Um, and it was the same with my grandmother on the Arcada. We were always taken down. So I was introduced to shipping in the 50s and 60s, but really exposed in the sort of first class level, which was amazing stuff in those times. Uh, almost eccentric, almost wow. Uh, nowadays we take it for granted or we expect it. Uh, but in those days, no, it was a different world. There was the shipping business meant business. It wasn't a cruise business. It was a passenger business. So everything was serious. And when you're invited, that's really, or well, you're being well and truly raised to the A list as we call it today. So there you go.